All right, well, as we're gathering, I was just, uh, while I was waiting, I was looking at Facebook. And, you know, Facebook will give you memories, things that you've posted in the past. So on this get day, seven years ago, I had been, I was walking in behind the church, behind these townhouses here, had my cowboy hat on, and I came across three little boys playing with guns, you know, the horror, the horror. But, yeah, <laughs> but that's not the funny part. The one thing happened, this little boy looks up at me, he goes, hi, cowboy. <laughs> and I, uh, hi, you know, I laughed, I went by, and as I'm going by, he says to his friends, I've never seen a real cowboy before. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was pretty good. So anyway, uh, so I had to post it for immortality on, on Facebook. Now it came back to me. Anyhow, so here we are. We're studying trustworthiness. Trust, trustworthiness. So we're in Lesson 16. And uh, the first bit is review. And you'll notice I put a fancy line there to review everything. It's not doing what I want it to do. All right, so... Uh, so what we're doing here is we're going into the book of Kings uh, to, uh, to study uh, the word of the Lord and trustworthiness of the word. Uh, Talbert says, No other book of the Bible goes so out of its way to cite God's words as the driving force and explanation behind the events of human history as the record of First and Second Kings. So we mentioned that the, word of the, the phrase, uh, the word of the Lord, occurs uh, 51 times in Kings, that means first and second Kings, and only 13 times in Chronicles. And then thus says the Lord in Kings 33 times, just 12 times in Chronicles. And we noted that Chronicles is 14% longer and covers essentially the same material. So that's important to remember. The point of all this is that all God's words are totally trustworthy. And so then our first look into Kings was on the man of God and the word of the Lord. You remember the prophet who came, prophesied against Jeroboam's idol, and uh, was told by God to go straight home. And then he delayed, and uh, for his delay, the Lord sent a lion who put him to death. And you know how that story went. Anyway, so that was that one. Now we're going to move to... Uh, what am I trying to do here? We're going to move to Elijah. Elijah and the word of the Lord. <clears throat> and so this is going to encompass uh, uh, chapter 17 through 21. So, And I have a little quote from Talbert here just before we start. The word of the Lord theme in Kings is like rain. The drops are scattered everywhere, but in certain places it pools into puddles. The next puddle after the Man of God episode is the Elijah Chronicle. So we're going to get there, but before we get there, here's a few of the other little drops of the Word of the Lord as we work our way through this book. So there's Jeroboam's son. Now Jeroboam uh, died, I can't remember if one of, I think one of his sons came to the throne, and then there was a grandson, A grandson became ill. And... Uh, the wife of the king came to the prophet, uh, <clears throat> and I believe it's um, Ahijah, I think that's the one. Uh, yes, Ahijah. And she, she disguised herself, and she wanted to find out if her son would live from the prophet. And uh, so the prophet discerns her disguise, and he says to her a very hard message. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 13, All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. So that is the word that the prophet speaks. Then, in the, the, later in the chapter, verse 17 to 18, then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. As she was entering the threshold of the house, the child died. All Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Ahijah the prophet. So here we have another instance of the Lord uttering a word through the prophet, and then uh, that is uh, fulfilled. So uh, it was a hard, hard thing for them. But then, uh, shortly after, sometime after, we have... The rise of Baasha. Baasha comes to the throne, 
And uh, he does it uh, this way. First Kings 15, 27 to 29. Then Baasha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha struck him down at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. So Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. It came about as soon as he was king, he struck down all the household of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam any persons alive until he had destroyed them, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. So that's a different Ahijah than Baasha's father. But we see, again, what happens in Israel. God communicates his word to his people, to the kings, and then he, uh, the word is fulfilled. All right? And then I have, uh, let's see, I have another one in this same series. We have the rise of Baasha, the fall of Baasha. So here's the passage, uh, 1 Kings 16, verses 11 to 12. It came about when he became king, as soon as he sat out on his throne, that he killed all the household of Baasha. He didn't really, did not leave a single male, neither of his relatives nor of his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the household of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha through Jehu the prophet. I'm not, I didn't give you the Jehu's prophecy on this one, but, but here again we see, prophet utters God's word of judgment, and everything happens just as God has said. This is a repeated theme in uh, Kings. All right, and then there's one more before we get to Elijah, and that is the rebuilding of Jericho. This one is interesting because it goes back many, many years. So here we have a record, 1 Kings 16. In his days, Hiel, or Hiel, I'm sure you'd say that, Hiel, maybe Hiel, the Bethelite built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, who's Joshua, the son of Nun? The just, the second in the command to Moses, and then he led them into the promised land. The book of Joshua is named after him. So many, many years before, Joshua 6, Verse 26 and 27, when the Israelites destroyed Jericho, Joshua made them take an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation. With the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in the land. So what we see, this is, this is actually hundreds of years later that this man decides to rebuild Jericho. And just as Joshua said, his firstborn and then his youngest son, both of them are, uh, are, are die. It doesn't say that they were put to death. It says they die, so probably sickness or something. And they die in the rebuilding of Jericho. All right, so before we get into uh, Elijah, any questions on anything we've read or any comments so far? Anybody got something? All right, so you're, I, I like it when you do because then I can drink more coffee, but let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Elijah, and I think this is quite interesting. <clears throat> There's a bit more than what I've, I've recorded in, uh, our, uh, or in our notes here, and I wasn't quite sure where to stop. But the place where we get to, I think, is a good stopping place, and we'll pick up a little bit more about Elijah next week. But here's, uh, here's where... Uh, where we're uh, going to go here. So Elijah 17 verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now we should give a couple of points of background here. First of all, um, uh, Ahab is the son of Zimri. We read about Zimri just in the previous section. So Ahab is the son of Zimri. He is a notorious wicked king. His wife is Jezebel. Uh, she is a, a Sidonian. She's from um, 
basically le where Lebanon is today, and a very wicked person. I have <coughs> seen in uh, the British Museum, when we were there, we saw some, uh, some ornamentation that came off the couches of Ahab and si uh, Jezebel's palace. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting that they have that stuff there. But in any case, that's, uh, uh, they were, uh, in many ways, they were very prosperous in terms of their rule of Israel. But they uh, were very wicked as well. And so because of their wickedness, Elijah comes with this prophecy. And so uh, one of the notes from uh, Talbert is that when speaking on behalf of God, uh, of God, the prophet is the voice of God. But this is the thing that starts the ball rolling for this uh, place where there's many mentions of the word of the Lord and the fulfillment of the word of the Lord. So <clears throat> the Lord uh, directed Elijah and he gave this word to him. After he, this is the next verse. After he's pronounced to Ahab this, this curse on the nation, there's going to be no rain for three years. Uh, well, it turns out to be three years. I'm not sure if he mentions the three years at the first. But anyway, it turns out to be three years. And verse 2, The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the book Cherith, which is east of Jordan. All right? So he's sending Elijah away. He says, Just go, hide yourself, so that Ahab cannot find you, and I'll take care of you. And it is... Uh, there where uh, he, he follows, he obeys, verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and lived by the brook Cherith, Cherith which is east of the Jordan. And uh, that is where the Lord sent the ravens to bring food uh, to Elijah while he sat there by the brook. As he's at the brookside, the, eventually, because there's no rain, the brook dries up. So he has to go somewhere else. And, uh, and where does God send him? Well, he sends him. Then the word of the Lord said, came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, there's a couple of things that are interesting about this. Where is he sending Elijah? What town? Or what place? Sorry. Zarephath, which is in? Sidon. Sidon, right? Uh, Sidon, Sidon, however you say it. All right. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I bet it's not a long I. See, we have a long I in English, so we're always wanting to say that, right? It's probably Sidon. You're probably more right. But anyway, that is, uh, that is where, who is from? Jezebel. So, so think about that. He's got this problem with Jezebel. He says, all right, I want you to go back to her home area. And, and, and who is this woman that he goes to, this widow? Uh, what nationality is she? Not Shulamite, no, that's, you're thinking of Elisha. But. Well, she is, she is, a, she is she's a, a Phoenician, she's a Sidonite, right? So she's the same people as Jezebel. So... And remember, Jesus makes a big point in, uh, I think it's in Nazareth, he says, remember when Elijah, God could, there were plenty of is, widows in Israel that God could have sent Elijah to. Right? But he sent her to, him to a Gentile. You know, like, so he's basically uh, saying, you, you people think too highly of yourselves. Right? So, uh, but it's very ironic. I think it's, and, I, and it's something that... Uh, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody comment on it, but I was just thinking about that as I'm reading it. There, he's right in her territory. All right. Now, this woman is um, uh, she is poor. In fact, I think if I remember the story, she is gathering her last meal to make her last supper. She's got a child, and she's a boy, and she says, "We're going to have this bread. We'll eat that, and then we'll die." That's basically what she says. So here's what Elijah says. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the, the, 
a jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. So through, through all the time, was several months, maybe a whole year, I don't know exactly, I don't remember exactly how long, he spent there in Zarephath with this widow. And the, you know, she would make, she had this little bit of meal, she had this little bit of oil with which to make her, uh, her meal. And Elijah says, it will not exhaust itself. So I think, you think about that. Day after day, she pours it out. Oh, there's a little bit in there uh, still, so maybe we'll have enough for tomorrow. And she makes the food. And then the next day she goes, and well, let's see, and they make a little bit more. I don't think that the, the pot suddenly becomes full. I think there's always just a little bit more in that pot. And so she's making the food every day, making the food every day. They're surviving. Now, I would, you know, think of how the Israelites got tired of manna. You might get tired of this little oil cake every day, for however many years it was, that they're uh, uh, living. But they're living. They're getting along. They're making it. All right, so what happens next? Who remembers what happens next with this woman? Anybody? Her son dies. Her son dies. Right? So she's, she's in despair, and she says, you know, like, you know, here, you, you know, God sent you to me, and now my son dies. So, uh, so what does Elijah do? He raises the child from the dead, and here's what she says. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Now, all this time, she's been having a little bit more flour, a little bit more oil, all this time. But now, she says, now I know. <laughs> because... Well, that would be pretty sensational. But it was just as sensational. Day after day after day, the word of the Lord keeps coming true. Yes, Tola. Was it the same woman that, the, that made a tent for Elijah? No, that's, a different, that's the Shulamite woman. And that's a, that's a different woman, yes. But yes, we have parallels in these two stories. And when we come to Elisha, we'll probably talk about her. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. This widow too, the son died? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, that's quite traumatic, of course. You can imagine what it would feel like to lose a child. I mean, I've, thankfully, none of us have, uh, in our family have had that, but I have had friends, and it's very, very hard. So, yes. Then about the, 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 the disabled, the difference between the disabled and the woman of Sarifat? Yes. God looks at our hearts. Yes. God knows Jezebel. Mm -hmm. He also knows the Sarifat's woman. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was, and God deals with each and every evil. Yes. According to our heart to us. That's right, yes. I think that's true. And it seems like she, I mean, she truly has a response here, which is really speaks of faith, doesn't it? All right. Uh, oh, Marlene, were you going to ask something? Oh, it shows like God is a provider. Yes. Yeah. It's like That's right. That's true. That's true. Her faith was challenged, and as each each step of the way, she has to believe more. Right. All right. So let's pick up. Where were we? Let me just check where I'm uh, at in my notes. All right. So now the three years is up. This is uh, chapter 18. The Lord directs Elijah to return to Ahab, promising rain by the word of the Lord. So here's verse one of it, chapter 18. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. But of course it's not as simple as that. You know the story, but we're just going to review it. So Ahab, or, or Elijah proposes a contest. Now you've been following, through the influence of Jezebel, they had been following the, the gods of the Sidonians, the, the Baal, all right, the the, uh, and the Baal is a fertility god. So he's the god that is supposed to provide harvest and is supposed to provide the rain, supposed to provide the things that you need for, to, for life. And so he's, we're going to have a contest to see who is, 
who is God. And so we have this, uh, this uh, uh, statement here uh, in chapter 18, verse 31. J Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the twi tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So this is just a reference to the word of the Lord. It's not a prophecy. But Elijah takes 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel to uh, build his altar. And then when he prays, he calls on the word of the Lord. Uh, verse 36, at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. All right? So this is Elijah's great moment of triumph. So he has, the prophets of Baal have been making their sacrifices all day long. They've been calling on Baal. Elijah's been mocking them and saying, well, maybe he's asleep. Yell louder. Cut yourselves. You know, do something. He's, he's, he's obviously not paying attention. And it's quite the scene. I, I, one of the, it's one of these most dramatic scenes in the Bible where you almost wish you could have been there to see actually uh, this going on. And so Elijah, and then he prays this simple prayer. And immediately the fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, consumes the water in the ditch around the altar. And I think it consumes the altars of Baal as well. I mean, it's really, it's just boom. You know, it's like very dramatic. Okay, so... Whose side are you on? Choose this day, people. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so the rain comes, and uh, they uh, and uh, it, uh, Je or Elijah runs down the mountain ahead of Ahab. He says, "You better get moving. The rain's coming." They run down the mountain. He goes someplace. Elijah does, and then. Uh, he is threatened by who? Who threatens Elijah? Jezebel. Jezebel, right? And what does Elijah do? Yeah. He runs. Now, wait a minute. Let's look at this prayer again. At the time of the offering, Elijah the prophet came here and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done it all, all these things at your word. And then Jezebel threatens him. And what does he do? He runs. Now, Elijah, what about the word of the Lord? You see? And so he's, he's all, it's like he's forgotten the word of the Lord. So, but the word of the Lord hasn't forgotten him. So here's, now let's look at the end of the story here. Okay, so the Lord, when he comes to a cave and he lodges there, and remember he, he ran... Um, 40 days and 40 nights, it says, without any food. He's just running. Ran 40 days and 40 nights. He came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he's, you know, he lays out his litany of complaints, and then the Lord sends uh, a strong wind. The Bible says the Lord wasn't in the strong wind. He sends an earthquake. The Lord wasn't in the earthquake. He sends a fire. The Lord wasn't in the fire. But then, I'm going to quote the King James here. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, what? A still, small voice. What's that? The word of the Lord. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him. And said, What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing? So, the, what's the message here? Look, here you were, you're depending on the word of the Lord. You're depending on the word of the Lord to deal with the, uh, you know, to, to announce the famine. You're depending on the word of the Lord to deal with Ahab and Jezebel. You're depending on the word of the Lord to, to, uh, to have food while you're in uh, hiding. You're depending on the word of the Lord to uh, bring the, uh, the rains back to Israel. 
and now you're running from the word of a woman. Right? And, and so here's this voice. Now, Elijah, what are you doing? And what does God tell Elijah on this occasion? What's he tell him to do? Maybe we should, I don't have it on the screen. Why don't we look there? Let's go to 1 Kings 19. All right, so the Lord, verse eight, uh, 15. He, first, verse 14, Elijah gives his complaint. Again, the Lord said to him in verse 15, he doesn't even pay attention to his complaint. Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram, that's the Syrians. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. Now Ahab is king. But you go to one of his generals, Jehu. He is the patron saint of all those who get speeding tickets. Right? Because he drives furiously, the way King James says. Okay? All right. So, uh, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So there's three people he is to deal with. And uh, so, verse 18, he says, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And so, what does Elijah do? He starts, he, he responds to the word of the Lord. He does what God says. But I think it's so remarkable. I mean, this is the theme. The theme is the word of the Lord. Do what the word of the Lord says. And even God's people, like Elijah, I mean, it's easy to blame those other Israelites who follow the pagan idols, we can say how bad they were, but here's Elijah, and he's been operating on the basis of the word of the Lord, and then he loses his courage. So I think the lesson for us is that you know, we, we have to grow in our dependence on the word of the Lord also. We have to grow in, uh, in faith to the word of the Lord. We can't let this world and the the opinions of this world become those things that rob us of courage. The word of the Lord should give us courage. Yes, Tola. At times when the problems are enormous, you are prone to fear and discouragement. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why the word of God, yeah. the assurance in the word of God. Yes. I think maybe because Elijah also is also a human being. Yes. So he was prone to fear and discouragement. Yes. Especially when the answer does not come on time. Yeah, that's right. The answer is not right on time. Yeah. It's not when you want it. That's right. Yes, that's good. Amen. All right, anybody else have any questions? Obviously, my notes were, I should have gone on, but I thought, oh, I'm getting close. We're looking at the pages. So maybe I should have gone further, but we're going to stop here. So any further comments or questions for today's lesson? Yes, Marlene. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So God does use things in a remarkable way. All right, Addie. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm just trying to tie this back to our, um, our previous lessons on trusting God, right? Yes. Because in this uh, lesson, all I can say from the journey all the way to the Zarka woman, I see trust and I see obedience. Yes. Because right? when you look at the journey, it just says go. Yes. And he didn't try to um, rationalize it. He didn't yeah. try to find out why you're asking me to go. I yeah. don't even know what's going to happen, right? Yes, <laughs> and yes. And he just kept, kept trusting and he kept obeying. Right. So in everything we do, we should always trust and obey. That's right. That's right. And it's interesting. Now, there is, we do have... The, the, there's one thing that I was thinking about here is he, he, when he has directions, when God says something, then he does it. Mm -hmm. Right? But when God is silent... Then he is, you know, he should be looking back and saying, okay, God has spoken, so I should turn to God and ask him to tell me something, maybe. You know, because, you know, God could have protected him from, uh, from Jezebel right there in the city. He didn't need to go all the way down to, he goes all the way. If you trace the place map on a map, he goes all the way down south, south of Judah. He goes beyond Judah to get away from her. All right, Christy? Is 
That's right. I think so. Yes. Yes. I think so. Yeah. So like there was something going on there where God was sustaining him. Yes. Right? Yes. So that was kind of yeah. Yeah. Well, he was. Uh, it, it's a very complicated story. I don't like to beat up on Elijah because I recognize that I am. <laughs> he's way stronger than I am. I wouldn't be standing there. All right. You know. Okay, Lord. I'm. I'm going to call down fire from heaven now. I, I'm sure I couldn't have had the faith to do that. So. I don't like to beat up on him, but people, but you know, clearly there's more to this story than we know, I would say, but, but there are things, lessons we can derive from it. All right, go ahead again, Christy. I think it also like points out how we're so um, sensitive to how people react, right? Mm -hmm. Like he did all of that and the people observing, they didn't just like get yeah. on the spot and be like, you know what I yeah. mean? That would be so disturbing, and then you have to go and slay all of those prophets. Yeah. It's kind of traumatizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, obviously it would be, a, you know, you'd be at an emotional low point for sure. But the, um, but the thing is, uh, the, um, I guess, so we sort of expect somebody like him to, to always be consistent, and I guess that's where we're. We sort of are a little bit in shock, but that, that point is that he, he just sort of let the word of the Lord become secondary and sort of got his eyes off God, I guess what we have to say. All right, go ahead, um, brother. I think I'll, sometimes when we go through hard times, yes. those hard times, maybe they are trial times. Mm -hmm. Yes, we believe, we yeah. have that trust. Yes. Maybe God knows the end of it. So at the time when the, 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 the answer wasn't coming, Yes. Maybe we had passed through some hard times. We had trained ourselves. Yes. And I think we shouldn't tilt. Yeah. We should just continue to believe. That's and right. Trust. And I do think that all of us, uh, you know, one way or another, you've experienced a hard time in your life where it was, you know, felt hard to trust God, felt hard to keep going, and are we doing the right thing, and so forth. And, um, you know, you just have to hang on and keep on going. All right, so Addie and then Maureen. Oh, thanks so much. And I just wanted to touch on what you said about when God is silent. Yes. Because right? we go through that in our lives. Mm -hmm. Times we just want something and it's not yeah. coming. But then I just want to go back to this verse that said, and I said the earthquake is the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after yeah. the fire, then there was a small voice. Yes. Those hard times, yes, it's pretty difficult, right, when you're yes. going through such... But then I think we should meditate and always uh, listen. Because right. His word says he will never leave us not for sake. That's right. So Amen. At those times, he's with us. That's right. And we can get clarity and direction. Yes, that's where, our, that's where our faith has to be. All right, Maureen, you're going to add something? Well, I was just kind of reflecting on everything that people are saying. And, and sort of what you were saying also is, like, Elijah, a man of faith, is a man who is subject to all the same things that we would be yes and i i do think that um in in the hard times i guess we we can't always expect drama right or you know or, or even sometimes when it seems like god is silent you don't even always know that he's working yes mm -hmm. and and but you have to i i think the the thing that i sort of reflect on and wish I had been stronger at, you know, at certain points is that, so that you don't be melancholy or you yes. know, whatever. It's just, it, what does God want me to do for today? Yeah. And I might not always know the answer for the future. Right. But I know that for today, I'm supposed to have love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith. So those quiet times, uh, I should be cultivating in my spirit. That's right. Yeah. The 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 joy of the Lord and the peace of God. Right. And until you have the time, it, what God does show Himself. Like you look back and think, Wow, God, God was doing things that I didn't even know. Right. You know, so I I shouldn't doubt in the middle of it. That's right. Yes. Okay, Rob, you wanted to add something? Yeah. As, uh, as our theme is the trustworthiness of God's word, so we can look at this and and just like Maureen saying, trust God. Uh, but here's my back to geography, like last week. They know where Mount Carmel is. It's still there today. Yeah. They know where the uh, Brook Kishon is. It's right down at the base of Mount Carmel, where they loaded up all the water to yeah. pour on the sacrifices. Yeah. And it's right at that base. There's a little hill, I forget what they call it, but where the false prophets were sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So not only 
there are their spiritual lessons, we can also trust God's word because you can go there and go, oh, here's the place. Yeah. You know? yeah. Which is sort of quite a, you know, quite an event to see. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it just brings about that. It puts the Bible in its perspective to, mm -hmm. to see these places. It's yes. Not some made-up story. You know. Yeah, it's not a made-up story. All right. So, Cullen, uh, go ahead. I was just thinking about how God spoke to Elijah in this passage because Elijah has, you know, had this crisis of faith and he's not in the place that he should be. And it's interesting because he's also having, you know, this breakdown. Where yeah. He's you know, emotional, and he's terrified, and he feels alone. But God doesn't address that first. He first corrects him. He right. says, this is where you need to be. This yeah. is where you need to go. You're in the wrong place right now. He corrects him, and then he comforts him. Then yeah. he comes, and there's the 7,000. Yeah, that's this good. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of things we can draw from this. All right, Gordon, you wanted to add something? I think you put your finger on it when you said that he didn't pray. All right. So many times in the Old Testament when we're reading where people go wrong, yes. they didn't pray first. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. Yeah. When you feel yeah. alone or you feel something, just pray. Yeah. yeah. And another thing I was thinking as we're all talking here, okay, so we're talking about Elijah and the word of the Lord comes to him on several occasions. Now, the word of the Lord will never come to any of us like that. Okay, so we don't, like it would be, it's, it's where, the word of the Lord comes to us here yeah. and nowhere else. <clears throat> all right, so what this is teaching us, okay, first of all, the word of the Lord is trustworthy, but we have to trust it here. We can't say, oh God, send me a prophecy, send me a prophet, send me a miracle worker, send me a, you know, whatever. Yeah, a, a sign. No, it's right here. Right here. We have to trust the word he has given us. And uh, I do think, and, and you know, I, even, even those men, like men like Elijah or Abraham or whoever, uh, you take those instances, those stories that you have where God communicates directly to them. Think about the number of hours or minutes that that communication would have taken. Right? Think how long that person lived. How much, what percentage of their lives did, was occupied with direct communication with God? A very small bit. And the point is, they, they had to trust God with, a, with all they had was just a little bit. Okay? And, and, but we have the whole revelation that God has for mankind right here. And so, so we can trust, we can hang in, we can, we can make our commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, our, the world we're in hates our Lord Jesus. They would like to stamp it out. They would, you know, you go to any, uh, any news article online where they allow comments and it mentions religion or the Bible and the hatred just keeps spewing out. We should just, you know, get rid of, you know, like just awful stuff that are, is said. You know, uh, we, we, have, we have to just simply trust the word. That's what it comes down to. And just commit ourselves to it. Okay, how are we doing? We are eight minutes early. Anybody else have anything else they'd like to add? Tola? Sometimes if you are trying to hear from God, mm -hmm. you are not reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to, at times, the devil with his guys and come and tell us another thing. Yes, yes. If our heart is too open to, we want to have a dream, we want to have a vision, and we are not bringing things on the word of God. Yes. We will go astray. That's right, yes. That's a good point, too. You know, people are wild. Oh, God, Lord, send me a vision when they're not reading their Bible. That's, you're, you're going to get, you might get something else. <laughs> so that's good. All right, anybody else have something uh, that you'd like to mention? Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll close. We'll take a few minutes, just don't rush off into the other room because they are, no doubt the kids are still going. Their, their teacher had a more, better judge of time than I did. <laughs> okay, so let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time and we pray that as we continue to study your word that it would uh, bolster our confidence in you. Thank you for the story of Elijah. We pray that we might 
uh, we might trust your word, even as he did most of the time. And Lord, that we would also pick ourselves up every time we stumble and uh, keep on for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.